Hi, I'm Elon Musk. Um, I'm the co-founder of uh, Tesla, SpaceX, uh, PayPal, and Zip2. In fact, the only reason I started a company back in 95, an internet company, was because there were only a few internet companies and I couldn't get a job at any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so they, um, I tried to get a job at, at Netscape um, and uh, sent my resume in and I tried hanging out in the lobby, but I was too shy to talk to anyone. And, uh, and I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll have to start a company because I can't get a job anywhere. Sometimes finding a job is more difficult than uh, having a job. And you start wondering if there's a point in continuing to do that. Maybe there's no point. Maybe you should start your own business. Maybe you should start your own school. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Bartolo from Gallery Teachers, and here we talk about the business of TATL, that is teaching English as a foreign language. Our very special guest of today is Miranda Karhast from uh, Twinkle. A few years ago, she opened her own school in Bolivia without even speaking the language, and she realized her dream. So if she has been able to do that, why can't we? Meh. This video is offered to you by GalleryTeachers.com. Check out our website if you want to start a career in teaching English. A lot of our members are teachers who just started. They took their qualification and then they have to market themselves. There are companies that say it's a fantastic period of time to be teaching English. Everyone is hiring at the moment. It's incredible. And from the other side, I read comments of people that are not able to find a job. Hey, there, there's something wrong. So what's your angle? Yes, we've had the pandemic and then we've also had all of these law changes in China where you've seen multi-billion dollar companies literally fold overnight because they can't continue operating. And I wouldn't underestimate the impacts that that will have on the difficulty of finding employment in the industry. I think now is the time when teachers are going to have to be, teachers who are looking for um, jobs are going to have to do two things differently. Firstly, they're going to have to do their research really, really well. So before they apply to a company, be like, okay, am I eligible? What qualifications are the benchmarks to this company? How do they want my CV to look? And tailor each application to that company. Um, so, you know, if you're applying to a job, read what they want and edit your CV to match that job description so that they will look at your CV and within 30 seconds they will say okay this candidate meets my experience. When I was running the school in Bolivia I was in charge of hiring all of the teachers and so I know that the HR managers will only look at your application for about 35 to 45 seconds before they move on because you are literally receiving <laughs> hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of CVs. So do your research, make sure your CV matches. Um, make sure that your CV is not longer than two pages. It has to be short and it has to be perfect. Not a single spelling mistake. If you, you, I was looking at a CV yesterday, they had full stops at the end of some sentences and not at the end of other sentences. It's that kind of detail that the HR manager will pick up on and say, okay, this is a person who's really on the ball. And this person is kind of like, eh, not really bothered to fulfill the requirements of making a CV. Um, and I think finally, the third thing that um, I said two, but there's three, <laughs> you're going to have to be creative in thinking about what jobs you might apply for and how you apply for them. So broaden your job search and also don't think that you just have to wait for a job to be available um, before you go after it. My first job as an ESL teacher, I did what's called a speculative application, which is I sent um, emails out to all of the schools in the country that I wanted to live in um, and one of them got back to me and I was like oh yeah actually we are thinking of hiring someone and I got my first ESL job that way um, so you and and also what I've done a lot is just walk into a building <laughs> if you walk into a language institute and you say hi um can you give me the name of the person in charge of hiring teachers? Who is your HR manager? And they'll say, I don't know, um, Paul Gregg or whatever it is. Um, so you get that name first and then you say, great, when can I meet Paul Gregg? Um, <laughs> so, um, and I promise you nine times out of 10, they'll be like, oh, he's actually here right now. You can go through. Um, so being a bit like, 
creative and a bit sneaky. Maybe, maybe sneaky is the wrong word, but um, kind of having the, the initiative to go to the school, find out the name, ask for that person by name will get you in the door. I like your style. When I'm uh, <laughs> teaching the youngsters some interns, I say it's uh, better to say sorry than asking permission. Exactly. And what's going to happen? Like, worse things worse, they'll say no. But that's not so bad, you know? It's yeah. scary. It is scary to just walk in and, and start asking people. But I, if you can... You are British. Now you are living in the US. How come you, yeah. were, you ended up in Bolivia? Um, so it was my dream to live in four different continents and open a language institute in my favorite continent. That was my dream. So, um, I've, which I've kind of done now. <laughs> so I've lived also in Tanzania and now in the US and we opened the school. So um, that, that kind of worked out weirdly. <laughs> you opened the school. So I guess you are a millionaire, right? No, <laughs> I don't think anyone goes into ESL for the money. <laughs> Um, opening the school was just, it was a dream that I think we just wanted to see if we could do it. And it's very much a social enterprise. It's something that's for the community. I would have been richer if I had just stayed teaching. Uh, this was definitely not a money-making opportunity, but at the same time, I'm incredibly proud that we did it. Um, and I think it's, it's enriched our lives, but just not financially. <laughs> We learned a lot, that's for sure. What I like about this story is that you didn't ask for a job, you created a job. And this is something that I think we should consider, especially now that the world is changing. And honestly, I have no idea of what will happen in a year from now. What I think is a good idea, if you can't find a job, at least you can build the job that you like. This is something that you did. You were very young and maybe this is the reason why you did it. How do you open a school or how do you make your dream job a reality? Um, so one of the, I've done some research now, I'm doing my master's in business. I've done some research into what businesses are more, most likely to succeed. And because the, the, the reality is, is that most businesses fail. Yeah. Um, starting a business is, if you want to become a millionaire, starting a business is like you're one in a million shot. Most of them do not survive and the ones that do survive don't grow. It's really, really, really hard to make a business that survives and grows. A couple of things that you can do to increase your chances of success from that baseline. Uh, number one, partner with somebody else. Find someone who has complementary skills, but the same goal and work together. Having those different skills will greatly increase your chances of success. Another thing that you can do is a lot of research into the market. So be like, okay, when people have this particular problem, i.e. they want to learn English, these are the options available to them at the moment. And that includes broadening um, your idea of who they could turn to. You know, it might be local at language institutes. It will include online language institutes. And it also includes things like video games. Video games are now competition for ESL institutes because young students are learning English on video games. So you have to think, have a really broad understanding of your local market where you want to go. And then within that, you want to say, okay, what is the gap? What need is not being specifically met that I can meet better than anyone else? So for example, with the school in Bolivia, um, there were language institutes available, but none of them had an incredibly high insured quality of teaching. So our, we were like, okay, what we're going to do is make an institute that we're not catering for everyone, but we're going to fill that top level need where people, you know, are getting the same experience as if they were at a language institute in London, for example, you know, it's that same quality. Um, so that's why we went down that road. A lot of market research, having um, more than one founder. Oh, can you guess the average age of a successful entrepreneur when they start their first successful business? Can you guess? They must be very young, uh, in their 20s. You are not correct, I'm afraid. It's 
45. Hmm, that's interesting. It's, yeah. So having that extra experience, having contacts in the industry will really, really, really help you. That's very encouraging because uh, a lot of people are thinking about a changing career at the moment and they are afraid they have to start over again and it's something really hard. How much money do you need to open a school? Well, there's two ways to start going about this. Um, you can do what we did, which is you throw all of your savings in. I think it was about $20,000 between us. Rent a big building, <laughs> buy tons of furniture and tons of books and just hope for that the students come in. Or you can do what would be a lot more uh, reasonable, probably, <laughs> which is called a, a soft launch, which is where you just start with you, maybe um, going to students' houses and then see how that demand builds up and kind of following the demand. So you grow as the demand grows rather than what we did, which is just like start big and hope that people arrive, <laughs> which is faster but obviously a lot more risky. There's a say, you pretend until you make it. No. Uh... Bake it till you make it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Say always we. We think, <laughs> even if it's just you, we are doing, <laughs> just because it looks better. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Let me check if uh, we have, we had several questions, interesting questions for you. What are the best and uh, better paid jobs in TEFL? Um, I would like to know too. <laughs> um, I mean, I imagine if you could get a job in an international school, um, that would probably be good. Um, are there any? <laughs> no. I don't know. If you're willing to go and live in Saudi Arabia, you can get paid a lot of money. Um, oh these like army bases in the desert you know i've been living in uh, uk for many years more than 10 years and uh, in spain in tenerife and uh, now i just arrived in italy that is my home country something that i didn't expect is that it's easy when you're going abroad i am a very humorous guy and i want to make jokes it was very tough to make a joke because i had to think about that and I've lost the momentum yeah. while uh, I just arrived in Italy and uh, I speak with my colleagues and uh, with uh, my students and I like the fact that it's easy. So until now, people were thinking about going abroad and uh, I'm asking you, what about staying in your home country and enjoying life instead of uh, sacrificing yourself? <laughs> Why did you make life so hard for yourself, Miranda? That is a good question. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I think there are people in the world who want to stay where they grew up and, but there's just something in me that just loves adventures. Um, I can't, I can't help. I just, I grew up just desperately wanting to travel. So, um, yeah, I mean, either, there's no right way to live. Just do what makes you happy. I'm very glad that I did what I did. Um, even though it was extremely hard, I wouldn't, it just felt like my life. I like the fact that you say extremely hard. So you are very popular, you are VIP, you are the face of Twinkle, but it's not been a present. You had to work no. very hard for that. Of course. Of course. And... One of the things that my boss at Twinkle always says is you see someone and you think, oh, wow, they just instantly like became really successful that never ever happens you never see the hard work that's happened for years to get someone to that point what is success for you is it money is it popularity is it i think i define success as when i reach my dreams my mission at the moment my dream at the moment is to help people have a great time teaching esl so when people comment on whether it's a resource or a video, whatever it is, and they're like, oh, great, this really helps me. Or thanks, I needed that. Or I did this in my class and it was so much fun. That's when I'm like, okay, success. <laughs> That's what success is. It's, and I think the hardest part of that for a lot, a lot of the time is actually having a clear idea of what you want to achieve. Um, that, I mean, it's so hard to figure that out um, but if you can and if you can relentlessly pursue it 
like a Rottweiler, <laughs> then, um, then yeah, you, you stand the most chance of being su successful. Thank you very much, Miranda. It's been uh, really nice to talk to you. I really enjoyed uh, spending this time with you. And, uh, Likewise. Likewise. <laughs> thank you. And uh, until next time, happy teaching and happy learning. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.